Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. Guys, today we are back to working on the Tally Ho Capstan project. Uh, we've been doing a lot of that here lately, and we are still working on this main shaft that the whole Cali the capstan drum, uh, winch drum, is going to be rotating on. Getting really close to this, this project is really turned into a big project within itself. There's been a lot of work just going into this. We've got it pretty much all turned. We've already test fit the pieces, everything's good. The last little bit of turning we got here on the lathe is I need to cut the threads on the two ends. Uh, we're gonna be doing single point threads, it's inch and three eighths, six threads per inch. So I need to get that done. And then there's also the keyways need to be cut in this for uh, both of the taper ends. And we'll be doing that over on the milling machine. So I think we are set up and ready to go. We're gonna go ahead and get our uh, single point threading done and then head over to the milling machine and get those keys cut keyways cut and then uh, I think we'll have this knocked off in the list where we can go to work on something else on this project. All right, let's show you what's going on with single point threading. So step one, single point threading is you need to get your machine set up to cut the number of threads that you want to cut. Now we're going to be doing a 3 8 inch diameter, six threads per inch. So I need to set this up for six threads per inch and I'm going to do that over here on the quick change gear box here on this lathe. So let me kind of show you where we're at and show you what we need to do to get this thing set up. So I've got you zoomed in here on the quick change gear box and on the, every lathe is gonna be different guys, but this is how mine's set up. And most of these, if you got a quick change gear box, it's gonna be similar. So you look on here and you've got some information. In each one of these little squares, there's two numbers. There's a number on the top and a number on the bottom. Now in lathe, you can either set it to run uh, on feeds, which is gonna be in so many inches per revolution, or you can do it in threads, which will be uh, in the case of a, American lathe is gonna be uh, threads per inch. And uh, I know that we wanna do six threads per inch. Right now, the lathe is set up for feeds. We got it on the uh, feed rod rather than on the, the screw that we'll be using for threads. We'll have to switch that over here in a minute. But um, I'm gonna look on here and find one that has six, which is this one right here. So we're gonna just drop our tumbler down and come over there, we're gonna put it in that slot, which is six. But if you look, there's a whole bunch of different options here. And there's some other levers we have to adjust in order to get it right. So we need to be in A and E. So right here we have the AB selector and over here we have the CDE selector. It says we need to be in AE. So right now we're in B. I'm gonna move this up to A and you may have to turn the spindle on the lathe to get the gears to, to line up. Uh, well, I had it and it moved. Hang on a second. There, well, I had it again. There we go. And it's locked into place. Same thing over here, we need to go to E. We're in C right now, so we're gonna drop this down. I'm just turning the spindle by hand. We're in E. Next thing is, I told you we gotta be, there's two different rods on the lathe, one is for feeds and one is for threads. Right now we're in the side that is for feeds. This one is not marked, but I know that to do threads, I need to come over into this one. So we're just gonna move it over to right there. And that will in turn the, the threaded rod that we need for cutting threads. So double check, six threads per inch, A, E, and we're in threading mode. So I think we've got this set up. We will confirm this. I always confirm it, uh, but we should be ready to go over here. So the next thing we wanna get set up for single point threading is, is I want to set my compound here at the correct angle. Now I am cutting a 60 degree thread. So our 60 degree point. So that point comes to 60 degree. That's the included angle. Again, you take half of that. That's the angle that I wanna set my compound to. So half of 60 degrees is 30 degrees. And you actually wanna go just a little bit less than that. If you read the books out there, it says to set it to 29 and a half degrees. So down here on the bottom, there is a little line and this is uh, engraved with degrees. You're not gonna be able to see it in the video. You're just gonna have to trust me, but you just set that to 29 and a half degrees for a 60 point thread. And the idea here is, is as you're feeding this in, you're feeding it in it's just a little bit where it's not, this backside's not dragging. You're just, you're cutting right there on, on the front. And when you're feeding, you're only cutting on the front edge of your cutter. 
you're not cutting on the back side of it at all. That's the concept there of going to 29 and a half degrees. Now, the other thing you wanna do is you wanna make sure that your tool is square to the work. So the compound is set at 29 and a half degrees, but you want your tool to be set square to the work. And the way I do that is when this Loris tool post is uh, I will just uh, come over here and um, bump it up against the quill on my tailstock. I've got my zero set right now, but I can't do it. But you, anyway, you'll bump that up, loosen this up, bump it up, and that will get this front face parallel to the quill on the tailstock here. And then that will make this side square to it. So another thing you wanna do is you wanna get your cross slide set to zero on the dial. You're gonna be doing all your feeding up here on the uh, compound and uh, you will wanna pull out on every cut. Um, so when you get through your cut, you're gonna pull out, go to zero or go to whatever, you just wanna get it out, come out of your work and then you're gonna come back in to a zero on this. You're gonna always go back to zero on this and you're gonna actually feed in up on the compound. Now, one of the cool features on these Monarch lathes is, is there's this little thumb screw on the side. And when you do that, it's going to stop you right there at zero. You got a hard stop. Now, if I unscrew this, it just freely spins. But when you screw that in there, I've got a hard stop at zero. And um, it's real easy to get back to that zero every time. I don't have to worry about it. So when I make that cut, I get to the bottom of my cut down here. I just pull out, I come back out, I clear my threads, and then boom, I'm right back at zero again. Now, if you don't have that feature, and not all lathes do, you just need to set your zero, and you just have to manually dial back in there. On my most of the lathes that I've run, you just have to look at that and uh, dial it in by hand. It takes a few more seconds, but it's really nice on this lathe because you can just boom, you got a hard stop that you can go to every time. So again, when we engage the, the feed or the, the thread on this, it's going to move the carriage out across. Whenever we get to the end of our cut, what I will typically do is I will disengage with one hand, the half nut over here, which I'm sorry, this one right here, I'll disengage that and I'll pull that out. Usually just a full turn with my left hand, disengage with my right hand, and then I can come back over here, go back to zero, wait for my my uh, indicator down here to go back to the number I want to engage on and we'll engage our half nut again to cut. Speaking of the half nuts, we talked a little bit a while ago about the, the feed rod and the threading rod. This is the feed rod down here. This one is turning fairly fast. That's when you engage your, your feeds. Um, this one up here is used for threading and you got that screw in there. They call it half nuts because there are two nuts that are in a piece in here. When you throw this lever, it clamps it down on this, this rod and then that's what's going to engage the carriage and pull it forward. And to make sure that you engage it in the same place every time, there's this little dial, threading dial down here. And let me just fire up the lathe. I'll show you how this works. So I've got my part turning. You see the threading rod here is turning and so is this dial down here. For threading, for even threads, you can engage on any number. On odd threads, you either need to engage on the odd numbers or the even numbers. I typically just always engage on odd numbers or even numbers. So I'm either going to engage on one and three, or, or one, yeah, one and three, or two and four. That way, I don't ever have to think about it. So whenever the number comes around that you want to engage on, let's just say we go with even numbers. I'll wait till that two comes in. I'll engage my half nuts. You see my carriage is moving. When we get to the end, I disengage. I pull that out at the same time. This goes back to turning again. We'll go back to where we want to start. I will go back to zero, wait for my number to come around, engage my half nut. So that's kind of the process of threading. So let's actually start cutting some threads here. I do a lot of single point threading on my channel and I haven't really shown these basics in a while. So if you've seen it before, I apologize, but for the new guys, that's kind of the process of how you set this up. There are lots of ways you can thread. Uh, single point threading is one of them. And for some applications like this, it's what I like doing. All right, we're going to go ahead and check our threads to make sure that we're cutting the right length. So what I'm going to, or the right thread pitch. 
I'm just going to very carefully feed that in until it just starts to scratch. I'm just making a very light scratch mark. And I'm going to feed it in a couple of thousandths more. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait for my thread dial to come around to the number I want to engage on. We'll engage the half nuts. And I'm going to just go across that. And it's just going to make a very light mark. That's all I'm doing right now is I just want to confirm that we're on the right thread pitch. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to get a thread pitch gauge. So I find the leaf in my thread pitch gauge for six threads per inch. And I'm just going to lay it on top of there. And I'm just going to confirm visually that we are set on six threads per inch. Um, I always do that because it's very easy to get the wrong uh, combination over there on your, on your plates or on where you're setting up your thread pitch. I have set them up wrong before. And if I didn't check it, I would have cut the wrong thread. So it's just good practice to do. Uh, when I get to the end of that thread, again, I pull my cutter out. We're going to go back over to the front. I'm going to go back to my zero, and then I'm going to feed in with the compound, and we're going to start cutting threads. And this is just a rinse and repeat operation from this point forward. Uh, the biggest thing is, is that you want to slow your machine down so you're not going super fast because this cutter is going to be moving really fast toward this shoulder. I've got a shoulder here. I don't want to crash it in there. And uh, with practice, guys, you know, I know this looks scary. I do it all the time. Uh, have I ever crashed a, a tool? Absolutely, but not in a long time, thankfully. It's just one of those things you get better at with time. So we're going to let this come in, get over pretty close. We'll pull it out, disengage, and go to the next one. All right, let's cut some threads. I'm going to put a little cutting oil up here on this. And uh, we're going to feed in. Again, wait for my number to come around on the, the thread dial. Engage. We're going to start cutting. At first, you're making a pretty light cut here, and you can make a heavier cut on your depth, but as you get in deeper, what you're going to find is you're cutting a wider chip on that tooth down there. I'm going to start with about a 10 thousandths in feed, and the first couple of passes is going to be real light cuts, but as we get deeper in there, it's not that the cut's getting deeper, but it's getting wider, so you get a bigger chip. Let it come across, get to our shoulder, disengage and pull out. Go back to zero, dial in, 10 thousandths is what I dialed in, engage, cut. It's just doing this over and over and over again until you get what you're looking for, get your cut, your threads cut to the proper depth. Now, as far as how deep to cut, you can look up in like Machinery's handbook and it will tell you, oops, I missed my, I'm talking while I'm doing this and I missed my, my thread gauge down there. But it'll tell you how deep you have to cut. Uh, and you can put a dial indicator on your compound and measure that and you'll kind of know when to do it. I personally just use a nut or something like that and just go for a good fit. Um, they actually make go no go gauges for threads it, it has to be within a certain range and you can check it but I'm usually just feeling it for a fit a little more oil on that I'm going to go to about a five thousandths cut typically on, on smaller threads uh, when your threads start to come to a point on the top, you're about close. You don't want to come to a sharp point. You want to stop a little bit short of that and start checking your fit. On a bigger, coarser thread like this, you are going to have a little flat on the top. But I, again, I've done this enough. I can kind of tell when my threads are getting close to being right, and I can start doing test fits to confirm that we've gone deep enough. So just a little bit of uh, about threading here, guys. And at this point in time, it's just me making a bunch of passes until we get this done. I did mention a while ago, there are other ways of cutting threads. Yeah, you can use a die uh, in a die stock. You know, that's, that's an easy way of cutting a thread. You don't have to do this whole setup. Um, and sometimes that's a good way to do it. On a big, heavy thread like this, I find 
cutting with a die is hard. You're, you're having to remove so much metal that it just, it's kind of difficult to cut with a die. It can be done. I don't have a die in this particular size, so that's not an option. They also make die heads for these lathes. They're, they're intended more for production work. You can set one up and very quickly, basically cut your thread in one pass. Uh, if you're using an old turret lathe or something like that, they were very common. Uh, I've got some, but to be honest with you, they take a while to set up, and if you're not doing production work, a lot of times it's just easier to single point thread a couple of uh, threads than it is to, to set one of those things up. All right, guys, I'm gonna finish cutting this out. I'll bring you back once we get kind of closer to that final size. stop right here. I think we probably need a little bit more depth on that, but uh, I'm just going to go ahead and give it a test fit. And I've just got a nut here. This is the nut that came off of it. I did run a die down it. Yeah, and we're, we're right on size. I like it. That nut was tighter. I have a die this size, so I ran a uh, die down that uh, nut just to make sure it should be should be the size so there we go we got that one cut out i've got the exact same thing to do on the other side i'm gonna go ahead and get that cut i'm not going to show that one but uh it's the exact same process and there we go our shaft is done on the lathe still got two more things to do to it again we have our keys so we've got a keyway that is in the taper down here. This is just a regular keyway that just fits down in a socket. We need to go get that set up over on the milling machine uh, so that we can mill that one out. And then this one up here has a slot all the way through it. This is for a key to fit down through. It actually goes completely through. Uh, so kind of a long key that just fits down in here into a slot that we will be machining into the cap of the cap stand. Uh, that that fit down into. So those still operations left to do. We're gonna be doing that over on the milling machine. So uh, let's go get set up for that. So I think I'm gonna tackle this one first. Uh, and I've come in here and determined that this is a 5 8 inch key, 625. It's actually, the sides of this have been kind of beveled in. So when you read across the top, it's narrower than it is at the bottom, but it's a 5 8 inch wide. And I've also done some measuring here as well as over in the socket that it fits in to determine that the height of this is sticking out uh, 1 8 of an inch or 125 thousandths. Uh, being 5 8 basically an eighth of an inch off of 5 8 is 4 8 4 8 is a half inch. So we need to sink our piece of key stock in, it needs to be a half inch deep. And I do have a piece of five eighths inch uh, key stock that we're gonna use uh, to do this with. I'm gonna have to clean that up a little bit, cut it to size, uh, we'll have to round over the edges or whatever. So game plan, we're gonna go over to the milling machine and set this thing up so that we can uh, mill this thing out, get it centered up on the, the mill. Now, one thing that I have looked at on the original and also looked at in the in the uh, piece over there is that this, the, the key that this fits into is tapered, just at the same taper as everything else. I would have thought they would have used a brooch or something to brooch that out, and it would have been parallel with the, uh, the non-tapered areas, but it is actually tapered. So when I set this up on the mill machine, we're gonna have to actually put it at an angle so that the top of this is flat. It is parallel to the work and we will go in there and mill that pocket out and then drop our key in. And then whenever we do that, the top of the key will be at the same taper that we're working on. So that's gonna be a little bit of a trick to set up over in the mill machine, but we should be able to, to get it knocked out. So let's head over to the mill machine and start getting this set up to mill our pocket. And then we will make a key to fit and get this side knocked out. Getting set up over here on the mill machine to mill the slot for this first keyway. And um, 
again, I needed to get the top of this taper parallel to the table. So I've just got a big vise in here. This is a, um, was this eight inch Kurt type vise. Got my part clamped in here. I got a couple of um, machinist jacks up underneath each end to kind of support it. And what I did is I just sweeped an indicator back and forth across the top of this surface until I got it running true. And I just bumped it around with a lead hammer until I got it running where it was uh, flat across that top. And I think we're ready now to start milling this. So, so next thing I need to do is find the center of this shaft. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually indicate off of my vice jaws. These are straight up and down. Everything else on here is circular and I'd have to do it at the exact same height and I'm gonna have to raise and lower my uh, little wiggler here or, or edge finder in order to do this. But with uh, the parallel sides of the jaws, that's gonna be the center of the part as well. So we're just gonna use that. So I'm gonna come in here, we'll lower this down and uh, spin this up and find that edge first. So the way this works is, is we'll just move that table in there to that and when it gets right there on the edge, it'll jump over to the side. And when it does, I'm gonna zero out my visual readout. I usually do that a time or two just to confirm, yeah. Yeah, we're good. So I'm gonna raise that up now. I zeroed that out on my Y-axis on the digital readout. I'm now gonna come in here on this side, do the same thing. And it jumps over. Just gonna look at the value and do it a couple of times. Uh, Two point two nine eight. Yeah, I'm getting the same thing, so we're good. Now over here on the digital readout, I can just I know what that the distance is between those two points. And I don't have to do any adjustments because we have the same diameter on both sides. It all kind of equals itself out. So we're just gonna divide that in half. To do that, I'm gonna use the half function. I'll hit the half button. I'm gonna select my y-axis. It automatically calculates half. And now I can just move the table over till that reads zero. And that will put me right in the center of that shaft. So there we go. Have to always kind of futz with it a little bit right there to get it that last couple of 10 thousandths. There we go, zero, 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 all the way across. So we are on the center of that shaft. We're about ready to start our milling here. So my slot is an inch and three quarters from end to end. Uh, so I need to figure out how much to actually need to move the table because we've got a five eighths inch diameter end mill in here. So to do that, you just subtract five eighths from inch and three quarter. That'll be from center to center. So the outside edges will equal uh, inch and three quarters, so we need to go an uh, inch and an eighth. Uh, 1.125 is how much we need to move. Now, I measured over there how far from the edge it starts, and it's got about an eighth of an inch, so I'm just gonna kinda bump that up against the edge there. This is not a critical measurement by any means. I'm gonna call that zero, and I'm just gonna move the table over an eighth of an inch, 0.125 right there, and I'm going to zero out the digital readout. So now this is gonna be my zero. I will go down, I'm gonna feed over 1.125, and then I'm just gonna be going back and forth between those, and it needs to be a half inch deep. So here we go, let's start some milling. Uh, we'll just turn our cutter on. And we're gonna start by raising the table up until I just Start the cut. All right, so that's just starting to touch. I'm going to zero my Z axis. And uh, we're going to go ahead and I'm just going to put in oh, about, probably about 50 thousandths. Speed the table down nice and slow. All right, that's 50 thousandths. Now I'm just going to take her for a ride down here. We're going to go an inch and uh, 
All right, right there. And we'll raise the table up another 100,000, or 50,000, rather. This is a center cutting end mill, so it should be cutting straight down through the center of the park. That's 100,000 steep total. We'll go back to our zero. I'm going to do some readout here. All right, we're back to zero. 100,000 is deep. We're just going to continue on until we get to a half inch, which will be um, eight more cycles. We'll bring you guys back. And just like that, we got our key cut. That is a half inch deep, inch and uh, three quarter long, and five eighths inch wide. So uh, all I need to do now is uh, take that and modify it into a circular piece of key stock. I could order a piece, but I can make one just as quick without that, I think. So that's probably what I'll do. But before we do that, I need to get the slot cut in the other side. So let's come up with a game plan on that one. So let's take a look at this end. We've got to drill and slot out a groove in there. Best I can tell, this is really kind of beat the heck up. You know, depending on where you measure it at, I don't know what it's look like it's Averaging about 450 thousandths. I'm guessing it was 7 sixteenths, which would be 4375. Uh, let me see if I can find I got the, the key that came out of it. Let me measure that and get an idea of how big that is. So this is what's left of the key that was in here. So basically this just fit down in the slot and it's been beat on and pounded on on the ends to get it out. So it's, it's not fitting down in there really good. It's mushroomed a little bit on the ends. But when you come in here and start measuring it, <laughs> it's, look how pitted it is. Uh, there's not a nice surface anywhere on there to measure, but you know, when I start kind of averaging this, you know, we got about four, three, seven, four, five, five, I, th I think that this was four, three, seven, five would have been seven sixteenths. So that would have been, you know, somewhere right along in there on the dial calipers. And it fits in some of those areas. Some areas it's a little bit wider, but again, it's been beat on. So I don't trust it. I think what we're going to do is we're going to make the new key seven sixteenths and we're going to drill this slot seven sixteenths as well. Now, um, uh, I think what I will do is I'm going to set this up in the mill machine and we're going to drill a series of holes through there, try to get as much of that material out as we can. Then we'll come back with an end mill, kind of like what we did on the other side and start working our way across those. I want to get as much of the material out of there as I can first though, and we'll clean it up with the end mill. Now, also I'm nearly certain I don't have a 7 16th inch end mill that is long enough to go through there. It needs to be, you need to have two inches of cutting material, uh, which is a lot of stick out. But anyway, I'm, I'm gonna probably have to order an end mill to do this with, but I can go ahead and get it set up and get it drilled. And uh, I'm also have to order a piece of stock to make the new key out of, I imagine as well. All right, I think we are set up over here, ready to start drilling out the waste in this uh, slot. So again, we've set our shaft up over here in the vise on the milling machine. Um, I did have to refine the center because before I was gripped up on a wider gap, this jaw is fixed in the back. So it's not like they're both moving in and out. So the center did have to be adjusted. Probably could have measured it and just offset it, but I just did it the same way with the center finder or edge finder rather. Um, I have determined that my length of my slot is two and a quarter inches from end to end. Again, we got seven sixteenths inch drill bits. There's about an eighth of an inch gap from 
the shoulder to the behold, I have figured out where I need to drill my first hole. I think I'm gonna do is go ahead and define the ends of this first. Uh, so we'll drill this hole, we'll dial over 1.8125, which should be put us on center to give us that uh, 2.250. So I've just got a center drill in here that we were gonna just use to kind of give me a, a point for that drill bit to start on. I'm just using this kind of as a spotting drill. I'm just enough to get the center of the drill bit in place. All right, one hole through. Hole number two. You can see my drilled out holes here. We got most of the waste material out of there. I now have a 7 16 inch end mill here. This is a four flute carbide end mill um, that I was able to find over in my end mill drawer. This one happens to be brand spanking new. We start kind of working our way back and forth. I'll go to my zero on the digital readout and just raise up to about 25,000. Work my way across. We're not even touching down there. So raise up again, and I'm just going to probably do about 25 thou per pass. We might try a little bit more here in a minute after I kind of get going and see how this thing looks and feels. But so far, so good. Well, I made it. I'm actually kind of surprised that I was able to get that whole depth. I didn't think I had enough end mill there. I thought it was going to be close, but I made it. We got that all the way through. Wow. Okay. Good. That slot is done. All right. I think we're done for these shaft or this shaft. Wow, this was a project, guys. This uh, took a lot more work than I was really anticipating. Uh, that's some tough material and um, just a lot, a lot of work, a lot of precision work, a lot of setup, a lot of independent jobs, but we got her knocked out. And all indications are just checking things over. It looks like we pretty much nailed it. Uh, the only thing that's really left to do is I do need to machine the matching piece that's gonna fit on this taper up top. Of course, that's the new casting that we have for the, the top, and uh, that's gonna be another pretty big job all in itself, but uh, we'll be working on that coming up soon. Uh, still need to get my keyway uh, just fit to size and get that in there, but that's no big deal at all. Uh, I'll do that off camera before we stick it all together, but she's, uh, she's ready to go. Well guys, one step closer to being uh, done with this capstan project. Uh, like I said, this was a big job. And uh, I think I was just counting up a while ago, kind of estimating the number of hours that I've got into making this shaft. And it's about 24 hours of actual shop time. Now, I will say that anytime that I'm filming in the shop, which I've been doing on this, it more or less doubles how long it takes me to do anything because I'm messing with cameras and trying to get angles right and everything like that. So, uh, you know, that's probably not a realistic amount of time, but still, I mean, I spent 
the better part of three days, and, and two of those days were long days with extra hours in them to get this thing done. And uh, it was a lot of work by all means. You know, I am a manual machinist. That's what I'm set up to do. And, but that does not mean by any means that I am, you know, against modern computerized CNC machinery. And quite honestly, guys, uh, this particular shaft would have been ideal to be done on a CNC lathe. It could have been done in a fraction of time. You could have programmed it. You know, this, would, this is a good example of where CNC uh, would really outperform, you know, my manual machining that I do in here. For a lot of my one-off stuff that I do, it's just not worth the time and effort to go draw it up and everything else to be able to go CNC machine it when I can just go to a machine and make it. But with the tapers and the, the complex design and everything else, like I said, this would have really had been a, a very good candidate for doing on CNC, but you can do it old school. We proved it, we did it. This is how they did them for years and years and years. Uh, and I'm sure that back in the day they had a machine, a manual machine set up for production work that would have done it in a fraction of the time. You could have set up a turret lathe or something like that. And uh, it would not have taken near as long to do it one off piece. But uh, you know, doing repair work like I do manual machining makes a lot more sense in most cases. Maybe not in this one, but in most cases it does. But uh, we got her knocked out. Guys, uh, we're going to be calling this one a wrap on this episode, and we're going to be working on something else going forward. I got plenty still to do on this capstan project, and a lot of stuff to make, a lot of stuff to put together, a lot of stuff to kind of just get all finalized. But uh, this was a big step toward getting it finished up. And I appreciate you guys coming along for the ride. With that, guys, we're going to sign off. As always, thanks so much for watching. Please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Those thumbs up and comments are greatly, really appreciated. Really helps feed the algorithms over on YouTube. Big, huge thank you to the guys who have supported the site through uh, Patreon and PayPal, which helps me out a little bit financially. Uh, there are links down in the description below on how you can uh, participate with either making a contribution through PayPal or do the Patreon program where you support monthly. Uh, if you really enjoy watching the content, greatly appreciate the guys that do that because it makes a huge difference uh, in really being able to, for me to justify coming out here and spending the time doing the videos, editing the videos, and all the stuff that goes along with it. So with that, guys, we are going to sign off. Again, as always, thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on the next video.